So thinking recursively, we're going to need a terminating case because if we look up at the body of up to date, And welcome back to episode 10 of Haskell from Scratch. In the last episode, we got our implementation of Redo to the point where it seems pretty useful and ready to use in some projects, but we don't know what's missing and what may have been implemented incorrectly without a project to actually test it with. So I looked around a little bit to see which project uh, we could try converting from Make over to Redo. And when I came across Redis, I knew that it would probably be a good candidate because it uses make, but it doesn't use auto make. So the make file is written in a way that's understandable enough to convert over to redo. So I went ahead and forked Redis on GitHub so that we can keep track of the changes over time, uh, converting from make files over to redo files. So let's take a look at what make does here. And I haven't been back on FreeBSD long enough to remember I need to use gmake instead of BSD make. And uh, basically, I'm just going to let this run and we'll take a look at it uh, when it finishes. So we end up with a number of uh, binaries here in the source directory where most of the source is located. I think only the dependencies are located outside of it. And I think Redis CLI, or command line uh, interface, is a good target to start with uh, for converting over. So let's just briefly take a look at the make file for Redis. I put it in sandbox here. So the top level make file um, just goes into source and then runs make. So that's what we're going to want to look at here. And you can take a look through this file. It's uh, just under 250 lines and the uh, Redis CLI is this uh, Redis CLI name. So let's do a search for that. You can see the, uh, the build rule for it here, which looks pretty straightforward. So let's start by taking this and making a Redis CLI dot do for the uh, redo command to rebuild this. Now the first dependency line is going to get converted into a redo if change, uh, if change here, and then this build line is just going to be a normal line. But we still have some work to do because there are uh, some make specific syntax in this file and there are some missing variable names. So I'll go ahead and make the changes to this file that we need, and I'll be right back to review them with you. And we're back. So all I did was convert um, make syntax uh, for variable references into shell syntax and look up in the make file what these variables are. And this isn't um, a perfect conversion of what Redis uses in the make file. There are some conditionals and some things are set differently, but it should do the job for testing right now. There's just two more things to change here. The special make file variable, which is the name of the target. And if you'll remember, we want to use the temporary name here because it's going to be moved over atomically. And then this variable is a reference to the right hand side of the rule header, which in this case is just Redis CLI obj. So I think we are ready to test this out and we'll go into the source directory, remove Redis CLI, and then redo Redis CLI. But we don't have redo uh, available globally. So that's the next thing we're going to have to do is get redo installed into somewhere in the path. So we might as well make a rule for this inside of redo. Let's go into the redo project and we'll make a, uh, let's just call it install.do so that we can type redo install. And install is going to depend on redo itself being built. And then we just need to install uh, redo into user local bin and then go ahead and set up a symlink to redo if change. So we'll use uh, S for symbolic F to force the symlink. We'll say user local bin redo to user local uh, bin redo if change. 
So let's go ahead and give that a try here. We'll do redo install. And now if we look in user local bin for redo, it looks correct and uh, redo is in our path now. One other minor change I'd like to make is adding dash s to install which strips the binary making it a little bit smaller. So uh, we don't need to type uh, dot slash redo anymore since we have redo installed. So we'll type redo install and take a look again and you can see the size went down by about a megabyte. Redo is still a pretty big binary because it includes the Haskell runtime or the GHC runtime. So let's switch back into Redis now and see if we can build the Redis command line uh, program. Uh, did, what did we get here? It looks like it worked the first time. So that's good, but I'd like to actually see what's happening in the script to make sure it's uh, it's working properly. So let's edit the redo source code. And here in uh, the command, let's add dash x to shell, which will cause it to verbosely print everything that's going on. So we should be able to just type redo install since it knows that it depends on the redo binary. It should be able to figure out that it needs to update it, but it doesn't. So let's take a look at what's going wrong here. If we look at the up to date function, it becomes apparent what the problem is. Up to date is going to look through the dot redo directory for install, looking for the dependencies. And for install, this is going to be the do script and redo the binary. So to redo for the install target, it looks like everything is up to date and that it doesn't have to do anything. But what it should really be doing is looking to see that the dependency is up to date itself. And so if you think it sounds like we're going to need to use recursion, Pat yourself on the back, that's exactly what we want to do here. We want to recursively look through all dependencies to see that they're up to date. So thinking recursively, we're going to need a terminating case because if we look up at the body of up to date, anytime we call it on something that doesn't have a directory in the dot redo directory, it's going to return false. So if we recurse too deeply, up to date will always return false. To see what I mean, look at uh, redo.do and redo if change here has a dependency on redo.hs. If we're here checking if the dependency is up to date and we want to recurse and check redo.hs, redo.hs doesn't have any directory here in .redo. It's going to hit this error and return false. So one way to determine when we should terminate recursion is to look to see if that directory exists. But I don't think relying on the existence of the dependencies directory is a good indication that something is a target that needs to be rebuilt versus just some source file. That should be the case after the second run, but I don't want to rely on that. I think a better option is to look to see if there is a do script for the dependency, and the presence of a do script would indicate that it's something that needs to be rebuilt. So we can find that out by saying, uh, let's say the do script is the uh, redo path. And while we're at it, let's fix up the name for redo path. A more accurate name is do path. So oh, uh, redo path, we'll replace it with do path. Here, 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 and here. So the do script is the do path for the dependency. So in the case that the do script is nothing, we want to terminate recursion and we'll go ahead and say that uh, the result is this uh, old MD5 equals the new MD5. In the case that the do script is something, we don't care what it is, we just want to recurse. So this is going to be the case, uh, for example, in our install.do. When it looks at the dependency redo, 
it's first going to check the MD5. It's going to say that it matches, but it's going to notice that a do script exists for redo the target, and so we'll recurse to check if that target redo is up to date itself. So we'll say um, up to date prime is the result of recursing into up to date for the dependency, and that's not quite correct because up to date expects a meta depths dir but we'll fix that in a second. Let's just put a placeholder there. And then we'll return whether the old MD5 is equal to the new MD5 and whether this is up to date itself. And you might notice at this point that we might be doing more work than we need to be. If the old MD5 doesn't match the new MD5, we should uh, just quit right there instead of recursing. And we could change this, but I don't really know if this is a premature optimization or not, and it might make this code a little bit more complicated, so we'll just leave that for when we get into profiling and optimization later. So uh, this up-to-date call will be on uh, meta depths dir and the... Well, we can't actually uh, just append the dependency because the meta depths dir already includes the dependency path. So we could try stripping that uh, dependency path off the end and appending a new one, but I think that's a little bit hacky. What we should probably do is go back to using a target instead of the uh, dependency directory already. And then let's go ahead and use the meta dir that we have defined above to change this part here to the uh, meta dir target. And so now, we can do the same thing here with metadir dep, because the dep at this point is now a target for the recursion. And we might as well be consistent with the style here. So let's save this and see if Flymate complains about anything. Um, missed a metadepster here. So metadir target and then the dependency. So let's compile that and see how it goes. Uh, running redo install again isn't going to help us, but if we remove the uh, .redo directory, try again, it should work. And notice that the trace here disappeared, which gives me pause, but let's see if, uh, if it's working correctly. So another redo install is now using the new version with the uh, dash x uh, argument that we added here before which is good, it's what we want. But when we run it again, it's uh, rebuilding things again. So something's not working right. So looking back at the source, it's probably as simple as this get directory contents isn't working, which goes straight into the exception, bypassing the trace show. And yeah, this was should have been easy to catch. And I'm calling it here with metadepster and didn't change that call. So as uh, flymake seems okay with everything, so we'll redo again and one more time and we see that now the uh, install.do script is running but the one for rebuilding redo itself is not. Ah, uh, okay I see it down here. Um, I changed the argument to uh, well I'm, I'm in rare form today. You know some days you just uh, make a lot of mistakes when writing code and you know those days you should probably just lay off the code but we don't always have that option. So let's try this one more time. Uh, after this install we should get, yeah, that's the result we expected. Okay so popping back up the stack to where we were here uh, what we originally wanted to do was see these uh, commands that were being run when we run redo on uh, this new do script we have here. And so now we run into yet another problem with our implementation. Obviously the target is not up to date because the target doesn't exist. And that's something that we haven't been checking for yet, so let's fix that in the code as well. All right, so for something to be up to date, not only do, do the dependencies need to be up to date, but the target itself needs to exist. So we have already does file exist, so let's use that here. Exist, does file exist for the target. And if this exists, then we will, uh, let's see, 
we'll do this part here and if not uh, just false or rather return false okay so let's compile that and install it and now try again here and finally we have the result we want so looking at this everything looks correct we have this redo of change that's checking the dot o files making sure that they're up to date which it has to assume they are because we don't have any information on how to build them yet and then it calls cc or the c compiler uh, outputting to this temporary file the result of linking all these objects together so let's do one more thing before wrapping up the episode and add a rule for building these objects. So looking back in the make file, there should be, I would expect some rule, and here it is, for building uh, objects from C files. So for redo, we will make default.o.do. We'll paste this in, and we're gonna make some adjustments here. So we want redo if change on the items to the right of this file here. So instead of %c, we know that we're getting the base name for this in $2. So we can say $2.c, and then we will just add the uh, make prerequisites here. Then, assuming we have Redis CC, we're going to compile that C file, and we want to output it again to the temporary file. So the only thing left here is finding out what Redis CC is, and I will do that and be right back. Okay, after pulling in a few of these variables, I came to a point where in the make file, these variables are not declared. They're actually declared in dot make settings. And we need these settings in shell syntax, not make syntax, but I don't wanna make a change to the file directly that's going to break the make build system in case we need to look at it again. So instead, let's just save this to make settings without the uh, dot before it. Oops. Make settings. Okay, I'll convert this and be right back. Okay, so basically we just need to wrap anything with spaces, with double quotes, and now in the do file, uh, just using standard shell syntax, uh, which by the way I should set, we can just include that make settings file. And then we're going to need cc defined here again. This is because make by default has some variables set up for the system compiler and so on. And I don't like duplication, but I don't want to make this episode any longer than it already is. And hopefully that won't be a problem making this uh, compile cross-platform because not every platform is going to have cc as a symbolic link to the compiler. But we'll deal with that when we have to deal with it. So now, using this do file, let's see if we can compile a .o file. And looking at re the uh, redo of change line, the first object there is anet.o. So if we remove this and run redo anet.o, we get the um, object file built and assume that it's correct. And now, if we just remove all object files and we redo the uh, Redis CLI, it should go through, build all the object files, and then link. Except that we're missing Redis CLI .o, and here it is, and this is probably not related to an error in redo, it just looks like some include flags are missing. And I'm guessing that the difference here between prev final C flags and final C flags where we're missing the uh, includes for depths is the problem. So I'll fix this off camera and come back in a sec. Okay, so I went ahead and just added the include flags here, and I needed to remember to put final C flags back here. Uh, actually, I just have these out of order here. This should get us to the point where we can remove Redis CLI and any .o files, and then rebuild. And if everything worked correctly, we've got our program. So for me, this is pretty exciting. We've taken a part of a popular system and converted it over from make to redo, to our implementation of redo, and validated that at least for this small case, it works. 
And I know that our do files aren't a perfect translation of the make files, especially the cross-platform and conditional logic in them. But I think that we can get there as we go along, and I'll make those type of changes off camera in the future. Briefly looking at where we're going to need to go from here, aside from building the other binaries, which should be pretty straightforward, we're also going to need to implement recursive redo, which is how redo was designed. You may have heard of the essay, Recursive Make Considered Harmful. And if you are interested in Make or ever use it, I can recommend it. It's an interesting read. But Redo was designed to run recursively, and so we're going to need to make some changes to get it to do that. I know that in this episode, we didn't make a lot of code changes in Haskell, but I wanted to make sure we're on the same page of how Redo is supposed to function and understanding the case that we're going to be working on, because that's going to motivate a lot of our work from here on out. So in the next episode, we'll look at more recursion by making redo itself recursive. So not recursive in the Haskell code, but recursive in the way it spawns processes in subdirectories. And we'll convert more of Redis over to using our redo and fix any problems that come up along the way. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next episode.